just like to say it's lovely to be here worshiping with you today and we trust that God will indeed richly and deeply bless us as we do the most significant thing mankind can do, worship Almighty God. On this Remembrance Sunday, we remember with thanksgiving and sorrow those whose lives in world wars and conflicts past and present have been given and taken away. Today we look to our Father and our God for a future hope and peace that he alone can give. The words of remembrance. They shall not grow old as we that are deaf grow old. Age shall not weary them or the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Let us stand for the two-minute silence. We we'll remain standing as we sing together the national anthem, the national anthem. Please be seated. The psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. He is our refuge and he is our strength. Even in world wars, even in pandemics, he is our refuge and he is our strength. We'll worship God and we'll sing together and we'll remain in our seats as we sing, Great is thy faithfulness.
Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Father, today we say with the songwriter, Great is thy faithfulness. For you alone are God. You are faithful because of who you are. We come this day into this place of worship, our Father in heaven, and we bow our heads, representing a whole bowing of ourselves before you, and we acknowledge that you alone are God. You alone are worthy of our worship. And we declare to you this day the worship of your great and glorious name. You are the God who created the heavens and the earth. You said, let it be, and it was. You spoke existence into being. And you saw what you created was good. Father, yet that good creation was marred by rebellion against you. And we live uh, from an unheard consequent of that fall. And Father, we come into this house of worship today. We come before a God who is absolutely holy and perfect in all his ways. But we come, our Father, as people who are perfect in Christ Jesus. But in how we daily live out Christ, we find imperfections. We sin, Father, in word, in deed, in action. And Father, we say with the prophet, we acknowledge at times the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But Father, we thank you that you try the reins to see what is in the heart. And Father, in those discoveries of sin we bring before you just now, we pray our Father that in grace we will experience again forgiveness that we will know your mercy and it will flow to us and through us and it will draw from us joy as we respond to the God who meets us in Christ Jesus. So Father, this day we pray that you will bless us and you will undertake for us, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our Old Testament Bible reading is taken from Psalm 119, reading from verse 65 through 72. Psalm 119, verse 65. Do good to your servant according to your word, O Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the organ have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and of gold. We trust that God will bless the reading of his word to us here today. It is with great sense of loss and sorrow that we report with sadness the death of Mrs. Stella Ripley, mother of Mr. Neil Ripley on Friday the 6th of November. Also, Maisie Chambers, sister of Mrs. Agnes Hamilton. Let us bring these families and the wider family circles uh, to God in prayer. Let us pray. 
Father, we bring to you in our prayers of intercession, we bring Neil and we bring Agnes, we bring the whole family circle and we pray our Father this day that in their deep loss that you would be on to them everything that they need just now in their lives. That you would speak and minister into their hearts of your love, your grace, your truth, your faithfulness. And Father, we pray that this day that they will find their consolation and their comfort in you. We pray, our Father, for the whole church family at this time who join in that sense of loss. And we pray that you will bless your people and you will encourage them. We pray, our Father, that you will undertake for them. And Father, we pray that in a really difficult time, in a pandemic, we pray, our Father, that we would find in you grace for each day. Father, the questions are many and difficult. We hear conflicting reports. We hear of uncertainty and we pray, our Father, for frontline workers that you would be on to them everything that they need. Our Father, we pray that you would give them understanding and deep insight into the situations that they face and the people they minister to in a medical way and those who do it at a spiritual level. We pray our Father for our politicians that they will collectively unite and bring together and give a clear path for the way forward. Father, we live in uncertain days. But Father, we pray that you would be our refuge and our strength. We would find all that we need in you. That we would seek to obey the markers laid down for us, the guidance that is given to us. But over, above all, and in all, we would trust in you. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless and undertake for your people. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell a story from the Old Testament. It's taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want the boys and girls and adults too, even grandparents, I want to tell you a story about somebody, two people, very, very famous in the Old Testament. One was King David, and the other one was Goliath. Now, I want to tell you a wee bit about King David. He was the, uh, the, the eighth brother. There was, he had seven older brothers, and he had two sisters. And David was the youngest, and the youngest one was always the, the boy who was sent out to look after the sheep when, when, when the whole family was growing up. This was the task that was generally given to the youngest in the family. The older ones, they were given bigger tasks and more difficult tasks. So David grew up as a shepherd boy. And Eugene Peterson tells the story of David something like this here. When David would have been minding the sheep at night, he would have been out in all sorts of weather, good weather, bad weather, and he would have had to stay out at nights, the whole night, looking after the sheep. And Peterson says he thinks David would have lay on his back at night and looked up into the stars, seen the constellations, seen the moon, and he would have went, wow! Look at all that! This is God's creation, and he's seen magnificently in creation the hand of God designing a world that he found absolutely astonishing. 
And then as a shepherd boy, David also, there was a lion came, took away a sheep. David went after it and killed it to get the sheep back. Then there was a bear took a sheep. David did the same again. So David knew God, this magnificent God who created the heavens and the earth, and he knew the God that was with him even when he was going after the lion and the bear. So one day, David, he comes in, his father, Jesse, he says, "Uh, I want you to bring some food up to the boys there at a battle front. The army of Israel, they are fighting with the Philistines. And go up and bring me some news of what's happening to your brothers on the battlefront. So David goes up, packs up the lunch, his father gives him, takes up to the boys, up at the, 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 the strong men and the older brothers who are up on the battlefront. And he comes up and he sees the battlefront. He sees the army of Israel lined up. And then he sees above that the army of the Philistines lined up. And he hears this giant of a man. He's over nine foot high. He has muscles like mountains. And he's holding a spear, the breadth of a goalpost. And he's challenging the army of Israel. He's saying, okay, here's how we'll settle the deal. Here's how the battle's won. You send out your champion and I'll come out and fight him. And whoever wins takes the whole lot. And the armies of Israel were standing and they were looking at the giant and we are told they were afraid. They were afraid of this great giant who bulked in front of the army of Israel. And David comes along, he brings up the lunch, and he hears the giant shouting out. He, he's, he hears him putting down the armies of Israel. He's mocking the armies of Israel. Who's going to fight me? And David says, I'll fight him. And he goes to King Saul, and Saul gets all the armor out and puts it on. David says, no, I want none of that there. I want to go out just as I am. And he went out and he sees and he looks. He slew the giant. He slew the giant with a slingshot. So when David goes up, he sees that the army, how could David, a shepherd boy, go and slay the giant? It runs something like this. When the armies of Israel looked up, they saw a giant. They saw a fearsome figure. When David looked up, he saw the God who stood behind the giant, who would deliver the giant into his hands. David looked beyond the giant to the God who would deliver. Lesson. Don't look at the giants. Don't let the giants terrorize us. Look to the God who delivers over and above even the giant into the hands of a David. Boys and girls, is there a chance in the world? There is. There'll be those people who be in school that'll say to you, and you love Jesus, and they'll say, you couldn't do that. That's a silly thing to do. But there is a God who will keep you and love you and give you the strength to walk and love and follow Jesus 
even when the giants are coming and saying things to us. Look beyond the giants. Look to the God who gives us the deliverance, the grace, and the strength. Let us pray. Father, we live in a time of fear, of uncertainty, and the giants seem big and massive. Sometimes we think the giant is calling the tune. But Father, grant us grace to see beyond the giant, to see the God who loves us and keeps us in every situation in life. Does that mean, Father, at times pain is taken away? Sometimes we endure it. But we don't endure it on our own. There's a God who is still ministering and keeping and working out his plans and purposes for our lives. Even in the storm. So, Father, bless your people, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our New Testament Bible reading is found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, reading from verse 22 through 25. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, commencing to read at verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And we trust that God will bless the reading of his word to us here today. In our Bible reading this morning, or this afternoon, we read how Jesus, he has directed his disciples that they're going to go over to the other side of the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. The day must have started out well. The sea was pleasant enough and the breeze eh, was enough to fill the sails for the crossing. Tired from long hours of ministering, Jesus lay down to sleep in the boat. But soon Jesus was calming a raging storm with an extraordinary display of power and authority over the wind and over the waves. Right from the very go, we have two pictures here of Jesus. The first picture we have of Jesus is Jesus in his humanity. He was tired from ministering and he slept. The second picture we have of Jesus is in his divinity, commanding the wind and the waters to be calm. Together they to reveal Jesus as fully God and fully man. He is Jesus Christ, he is Lord, and he is Lord of all. The tranquil scene that started the day was brutally interrupted by what Luke calls a squall. Uh, literally, that is a sudden, violent gust of wind that comes rushing through the mountains and comes down and hits the Sea of Galilee, causing violent disruption. On this day, this violent eruption comes down, and the boat the disciples and Jesus are in, it is hit with mighty waves, and it begins to reel and take in water. These disciples, they're seasoned fishermen. They knew the Sea of Galilee inside out. They knew storms could blow up, but they always hoped to avoid them. 
And the question, however, is not how do we avoid the storms, for storms will always come. They are inevitable. Storms will always come. But the question is not how do we avoid them. How do we respond to them? How do we respond to the storm? In the storms of life, we see a spiritual picture. And that spiritual picture is vital for us to grasp. The storms are one of God's way of leading us by faith into undiscovered depths of his love and grace and mercy for us. Without the storms, without the difficulties, without the trials, without the painful failures, we would never grow and go on to become what God wants us to be. We learn things in the darkness and in the pain of the storms. We learn things about ourselves and about God that we can learn nowhere else. The storm throws up hard and difficult questions for us. Questions we shy away from in the the normal routine of life. Questions like, is Jesus real? Where is Jesus in my pain and my suffering? How can he possibly sleep when I am in this pain? The pain will not settle for platitudes. It will not settle for easy throwaway answers. The pain cries out for embrace of something or someone bigger, infinitely bigger and better and more able than I am in the storm. There is a deep searching loneliness and pain that demands something deeply authentic, something that is genuine and real and able to answer the ache and the cry of the heart. There is a cry in the storm that only God can answer and only God can satisfy. The disciples had been with Jesus for some time now. They had heard Jesus preach with great power and a great authority. Never one preached like this, Jesus. He has just preached the Sermon on the Plain. The equivalent would have been in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. Only Luke is a shorter version. These disciples, they had seen him perform many miracles of healing, including raising a widow's dead son. They had seen Jesus preach, seen him teach, watched him perform miracles. But when put to the test, their faith was found wanting, for it crumbled in the storm. Master, Master, we are going to drown. These were disciples who in some way had become familiar with the Master. They had lost sight of who he was, this glorious, majestic, unholy Jesus. Do we not know what it is like to be like these disciples at times? We know the right things to say. We know the right things to do. We know Jesus as Savior. We know that he died on the cross to redeem us from our sins penalty. Yet at times we live dry, mechanical, like Christians. We go through the motions. We ease through life with a nodding smile of acquaintance to the unmeasurable depths of God's redeeming love and forgiveness toward us in Christ Jesus. We live without awe, unastonished and unbroken by the glory and the humility of a God coming to us on the cross. Let the truth be told, At times we need awakening. At times we need the storm. So what is the storm? The storm is a grace-laden, God-glorifying, life-transforming, painful encounter providentially appointed by God. So what does the storm do? 
The storm of necessity drives us to an end of ourselves. It drives out any sense of self-reliance. The storm says, I can't cope with this. I haven't the mechanisms to deal with this. The storm drives us out of ourselves, out of our accomplishing dependencies, our self-accomplishing dependencies. The storm drives us out of self. And then it drives us to Jesus. God uses suffering at times to bring us to the end of ourselves where we run out of what I can do in this situation. He brings us to an end of ourselves and brings us back to Christ. On the Sea of Galilee, it seemed to the disciples that Jesus was unaware of their plight in the storm. He was asleep. I would think one of the big questions that need answering is why did Jesus sleep in the boat while the disciples were in such fear of death? The answer, I believe, is that Jesus could have done without falling asleep in the boat. He could have commanded the wind while it was still on the way down the mountains before it hit the sea. He could have commanded the wind back then to stop and don't come near the sea. But Jesus didn't. Jesus had something better. He had something more fully. He had something deeper for the disciples on a calm sailing across the sea. He had waiting for them an awakening to who he was as Lord of all. So the first thing we see about the crossing something these disciples should have known and understood was that if Jesus said in verse 22, let's go over to the other side of the lake, then that is exactly what would happen. They would go over to the other side of the lake. They would not be drowned in a storm in the middle of the lake. This was an absolute given. Jesus said, let's go over. But in the middle of the storm, and as our fears heightened, they woke Jesus up and they cried out to him, Master, Master, we are going to die. One writer pointed something like this here. What do you think Jesus thought to himself when the disciples woke him up and said, shouted, Master, Master, we are going to die. I wonder, did he think to himself, Jesus, that is, going to die? You have no idea of the plans I have for you. As my disciples, you will bear witness to my life, my death, my resurrection, my ascension to glory. I will build my church upon your witness of who I am. Die in the storm? Never happen. Luke tells us in verse 24b that Jesus got up rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm resided, and all was calm. As Jesus spoke, the driving wind and raging waters were rebuked by a voice and a power that was greater than any hurricane. Jesus calmed the storm. Many take it that the miracle, the miracle account of calming the storm stops here. Jesus calmed the storm. The disciples are safe. Great. We are safe in the storm. Great. Good end, the storm account. But it doesn't stop here. After calming the sea, Jesus asked the disciples, Where is your faith? That question might seem harsh. Asked of why they were afraid in the storm, they might well have answered Jesus, did you not see the height of the waves? Did you not see how much water the the boat had taken in? Their fear of the storm revealed their lack of faith. Their hearts sank as they saw more of the storm than they did of Jesus. 
The storm was bigger and more fear installing than Jesus. Unbelief. Unbelief dulls the heart and robs it of all that sees the wonder and the glory and the beauty and the majesty of the God who meets us in Christ Jesus. Fear robs us, dulls our hearts, the greatness of who Jesus is. But when Jesus came the storm, we read then in verse 25, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. The first question the disciples asked in the storm was, where are you, Jesus? Help us. And the calming of the storm prompted a second, deeper, and more searching question. Who is this? He commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. Who is this? That's the second question prompted in the storm and in the calming. Who is this Jesus? The fear of the storm has gone, that has bypassed, a new fear now has taken over them. This fear was not a crippling, paralyzing fear. It was not a fear that threatened to rob the disciples of life. It was a fear filled with hope. It was a trembling fear of awe and wonder that would energize and transform the disciples' life. We see something similar in Luke chapter 5. Uh, with the miraculous catch of fish and Jesus is told Simon Peter to push out into the deep and let down their nest to catch fish. Simon Peter said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and we haven't caught a bite. Why do you want to go back out there again? But he pushed out at Jesus' request and they caught a great haul of fish that needed the partner's help from a boat to land this great catch. Then we read at the end of that miracle account of the catch of fish, verse 8 of Luke 5. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Go away, he said. Leave me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Peter, with all his fishing skills and all his know-how, had fished all night and caught nothing, but in seeing the large, huge uh, catch of fish, He bowed in deep humility and in awe before Jesus. Peter saw two great realities. He was a great sinner and Jesus was a great and glorious saviour. The disciples, their fear was draped in awe and in holy wonder at Jesus. It was overwhelming as it surged forward in a new world of hope and possibilities by opening their eyes of faith as to who this Jesus was, as to the unspeakable glory and the majesty and mystery of who Jesus was, God and Christ coming to us. What was dawning on them was that Jesus had absolutely sovereign power and authority over all aspects of nature and supernature. He is Lord of all. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Surely the Psalms these disciples would have grown up on, that they were nurtured on from childhood, would have broken upon their lives with awe and with wonder. Here's four of those Psalms. Each Psalm refers to God. Psalm 65, 7. He who stills the roaring of the seas and the roaring of the waves. Psalm 89, verse 9. You rule the raging of the sea. When, it wa when its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 93, 4. Mightier, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Psalm 
Psalm 107, verse 29. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Who is this Jesus? He is God with us. He is God, the Word, become flesh in our midst, walking and talking and healing and saving, exercising power and authority over sickness, wind and sea. He is the Lord. He is Lord of life's greatest storm, death itself. For he conquered it on the cross when he died for our sins and rose again to the eternal glory of God his Father. He is the only one who makes sense out of life and gives meaning and purpose to its every detail, including the storms. Concluding thought. The disciples were permitted to suffer fear and panic by way of Jesus sleeping in the storm. An onlooking world might say, this is not the way to love and care for anyone. True love would halt the storm before the devastation and the fear arose. But Jesus' desire for his disciples was that they would witness more than being saved from a storm. His desire for them was that they would taste and savour and be deeply satisfied and transformed by the awe of this majestic and glorious God who comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In the storm, God has something more for us than the calming. He has for us fresh, heart enthralling, life transforming discoveries of who He is. That He is the majestic, glorious God who comes to us, speaks with us, dies for us, raises again for us, coming back again for us. He is this God who is Lord and Saviour of all. Let us pray. Father, help us to see Jesus. Help us to see more and more and more of him. Even in the conflict, even in the hard places, Bring us, we pray, Father, deeper into who you are, the God who meets us in Christ Jesus. We ask us in his name. Amen. Our final praise uh, this afternoon is in Christ alone. We'll remain in our seats and we'll sing of a can through our masks in Christ alone. <laughs>
Please take your seats and a steward will guide you on how and when to exit through the vestibule. Am I reading this for the right place? Is there, where's the vestibule? Right, right, sorry. How and when to exit through the vestibule where we will find the offering plates. The stewards will be starting with the left side of the building from the back to the front. They will then move to the other side of the building again from the back to the front. The benediction. Sorry, it does work a wee bit differently in a hurry. Sorry about that. The benediction. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.